I'm very glad to be joined today by Claire Martin from the St Ethelburgers Centre for Reconciliation and Peace in London. We're speaking as part of a project that I'm involved with looking at how design and designers in particular can foster qualities of love in various contexts, be that personal or public. So hi there, Claire. Hi, Mark. Hi, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Look, hoping that we can tease out particularly this question of what love might look like in the public. And that means at a social or civic level, maybe even civilizational. But St Ethelburgers is a centre for reconciliation and peace. It came out of bombings in London when the troubles hit the city. Um, it's built from the ruins of a church. And so in its bones has the desire for peace, for love, for reconciliation. And through meetings, through gathering people, um, a variety of activities, talks, um, that's what you work to promote. So I wonder whether, you know, is can we just leap straight in at a first pass? What does this word love mean to you in the work that you do? What what's it what does it look like in that kind of context? Oh yeah, thank you, Mark, and, and thank you for inviting me into this conversation. Um I think you know, as I was saying before we began the recording, I've spent a bit of time sort of listening to your introductory talk to this project and listening to the different participants, you know, speaking their their response to that to that question. And I think it's um it's a really beautiful project. And I think one of the things that touched me listening to you speak about it and, and listening to some of the other participants speak about it, um, just at quite a human level, was the quality of vulnerability that I saw those participants speaking into the conversation. And um, I thought just that I really picked up that feeling tone and how, um, and how sensitive and soft a quality that that was to bring into a conversation about, about reshaping civic space. And also each one of those um, design practitioners, they were all speaking about design from a different perspective. They were often talking about quite, you know, gritty, gnarly um, social and, and, and technical problems that they were approaching and bringing this language around love um, and that quality of vulnerability into those conversations felt, it just felt really good to me. Um, so, and I felt very touched by that. In terms of our work here in St. Ethelberg is and what, you know, what that question means to me, it's a really, it's a really big question. Um, and I think, you know, what, one of the, you know, one of the most important things that we do at, at St. Ethelberg is aside from all of the different, you know, programs and events and workshops that we run is that we are the, we are custodians and stewards of this, you know, historic space that we, that we occupy um, and of the historic stories, you know, that, that belong to this, to this space. And so when you ask me that question, you know, I really I sort of go back to those stories and what those stories um, can teach us. And you mentioned, you know, our, our, our founding story, which is probably the story that is most known, you know, that people think of when they hear of St. Ethelberg as if they do know of us. And that is, you know, the story of the 1993 bombing. Uh, and prior to that, of course, there was an ancient, you know, 800 year old church that at the time that it was built was the tallest, you know, building in the city of London. Uh, and that had endured as, as a place of worship, right? Where people gathered to love God together you know, over centuries <laughs> and through all kinds of crises, you know, the fire of London kind of, it's according to legend, the fire of London, you know, burned right up to the place right across the street from St. Ethelburgus, but the church itself was spared. And the, you know, 
the blitz and the plague and all of these things. Um, and then, of course, uh, in 1993, the IRA bomb, whose target was the financial district, which surrounds us, the collateral damage was the destruction of this of this ancient church. And um, and the story goes that the Bishop of London at the time, Bishop Richard Chartres, came and he stood in the ashes and he prayed. Uh, and it was in prayer that he received a sort of vision or intuition that became the germ of this of this idea to to rebuild not another church, not a, a, just a place of Christian worship, but a building that could house um, difficult, tender, sensitive, challenging conversations, uh, you know, across divides, geopolitical divides, inter and intra religious divides, you know, a center for reconciliation and peace. And so that was the inception of the project. And um, Mark, you've come and you've, you've visited the center. And for those who, who know us, you know, the, there's something very intentional about how that history is really legible in the building. So the building bears its scars in a very honest and, and visceral way. You, it tells the story of the bombing. So, you, you know, there's partly restored and reconstructed areas and partly new areas. And the, the joins between the old and the new are, you know, they're left in a very sort of raw and visceral and visible way. And so for me, there's a few teachings in that story about what it means to, um, you know, to move from love as a design principle, which I think is one of the themes of, the, of your project, isn't it? And I think for me, um, you know, the first teaching in that story is, is, <laughs> is when Bishop Richard Chartres is seeking how best to respond, he turns to the inner, he turns to prayer. Um, and I think that feels very important to me as a person of faith, but it also feels quite important in the sense that, um, you know, the first move towards inviting love as a response to a you know, an overwhelming crisis, a ch civic challenge, a, ch a crisis of conflict, of hot conflict, is, is an act of reverence and respectfulness. And that feels really important to me because I think it's very easy. It's a kind of inherited, unthought assumption, I think, in our hyper secular culture that there are powers that are available to us that we can use our own moral conscience and our own inclinations to put to use for human ends and i think starting from moral conscience <laughs> is is good but i think that starting with reverence and a sense that you know, and I say this again as a person of faith, right? That love is a power whose sovereignty lies with the divine. It, it is a power that is beyond us. And to be in right relationship with that is to be in a relationship of reverence and respectfulness. And I think it's helpful for me to remember that and helpful to avoid you know, the potential of falling into a kind of shadow relationship with qualities of the inner, which can become unconsciously appropriative or expropriative, even with the best of intentions. So I think that's one of the really important teachings that I take from that story. And I think the next teaching that I take from it is the sort of, is the incredible vulnerability and honesty with which Bishop Richard, he sort of didn't, the story doesn't tell you about him praying, you know, in the comfort of his home or watching the news on television. You know, he comes and he stands in the ashes. He brings himself really to the threshold of 
this anguishing moment. He doesn't shy away from it. And I think that takes a lot of courage and humility. Um, and again, you know, I find, I've, I'm sure like you, Mark, <laughs> spend a lot of time in conversations with activists and NGOs and social purpose organizations. And my personal experience is that those conversations can feel completely different when we begin with a shared act of witness when we name and we sit with some of the uncomfortable challenges you know, that we want to bring a good response to, and when we bypass that, and when we don't have those conversations and we don't concretize and realize those truths. And I think that, so that sort of patient and truthful and honest act of witness, you know, he, he stands in the ashes. That feels like quite an important teaching in that story for me. I think the other important teaching has to do with conflict. And so for me, and I suppose this is, you know, it's natural. I work in a peace center. For me, you know, living love in public life has something to do with taking a constructive and courageous and sort of welcoming attitude towards conflict to, to in a way put, you know, put conflict in the center and to seek the generative opportunity that is there to not shy away from it. Um, and again, just going back to how the building, it doesn't put something on top of conflict that's new, that's aspirational, it remembers that conflict and it brings people back into that moment. And of course, so much of the work that we do is about bringing people together across very painful, tender, difficult conflict divides um, and trying to restore and resilience shared public life in that place. And I think for me, that feels very important. And, I, and, you know, also in the sense that we're living in such polarized times, I think that, you know, our shared sense making and our shared ability to problem solve at the scale and depth that's really needed in our time really needs that depth of collaboration. Um, so that, that's a teaching that I take from that story. And of course, the, the, the last one that I can think of anyway, is just something really simple, which I sense is at the heart of your project as well, which is about putting values into action. You know, I mean, another interesting detail of the story, which is perhaps not quite as well known, is that um, at the time of the bombing, the insurance on the building had just run out. So there, there wasn't actually any money for a rebuild. Uh, and it was really uncertain. You know, you can imagine, and anyone who's come to visit this part of London, you know, we're surrounded by these towering skyscrapers. Every kind of square inch of ground has been capitalized on. Um, and it was hugely sort of valuable piece of land. There was a lot of speculation about what would be done. Um, and Bishop Richard was able to sort of galvanize a movement of people who were willing to support this vision and, and make it happen. And um, I think there's something about taking an insight that's given from the inner and taking um, your intention and your aspiration and, and putting that, you know, putting that into action and all of the graft and the diligence and the hard work and the dedication that's required for that. And so for me, I think that's another aspect of what living love in public life looks like now. Look, thank you very much for those several points. And maybe um, I can um, reflect them back to you and we can sort of tease out any further elements in there. I mean, one, one immediate one that strikes me 
um, is where you're actually sat. Um, behind you, you can see the stained glass window, which is one of the windows in the tent that it is at St. Ethelburger's. It's a Bedouin tent, a circular structure designed to foster the way that people meet um, in a openness. You mentioned vulnerable, um, but also um, there's something about the tent that doesn't close you off, but keeps you connected with what's around and about too. Maybe there's something about fabric that's porous and that affects the quality of the conversation which you can have in that tent. I, I know, um, as you say, I've been there. Um, and so perhaps one way in which you remember the story of the place, foster this vulnerable quality, um, is by almost invoking the place itself. That is part of what helps things. Um, and so it's a love which reaches out to that which is around um, and and uses that as a resource to then have a more open, loving attitude towards the people in the conversation. Um, it, it, it's sacred in that sense, um, you know, and, and I feel that must be, may, may, I, well, is that part of, as it were, almost your design principle as well, um, that, that, that makes it a particular, the fact that it's a particular place, um, it's not just a historical detail, it's a living, part of what St. Ethelburgers offers. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Mark. And of course, the tent is another is another kind of, um, you know, beautiful space that we hold. And it also, you know, there's all kinds of stories behind the tent. Um, so the tent was uh, created, uh, I think, partly as a response to 9-11. I think there was a said this was long before my time. Um, I think there was a sense at the time that the main uh, space, the, the nave space, was still very imprinted with, you know, with the Christian atmosphere. So it, it still does feel like a church. And that to create a space that was really welcoming of diverse faiths. Yes, they at the time they thought, well, we, we need to create a different kind of space that doesn't already feel imprinted very strongly and authoritatively with, with one with one faith. Um, and so they commissioned uh, Keith Critchlow, who at, who was a foremost leading um, scholar of sacred geometry, to design such a space. And so he uh, he designed this this Bedouin tent, and as you as you say, it's a circular space. Um, there are seven here. You can see one window. I think this is the one in English that says peace. But there are seven other stained glass windows that each uh, show the word for peace in a different language, and that show slightly different. Um, imagery um, of these different suns and moons in different phases of the moon and different trees and their fruits that are come from different parts of the world and that celebrate different cultures. Um, and you're exactly right. You know, I would say the tent is a kind of absolute case study of, of, a, of a design project that was designed like with love as its, as its driving principle, as its guiding light. And um, Keith Critchlow has, has written quite a, a bit about, um, you know, about, about his thinking and about, about the, his design process. And of course, the Bedouin tent is normally a square, a square structure. And, and he decided to innovate and to make it into a, a circular structure, um, precisely for the reason that you just described, that the, the space, the space composes a group into a circle in a way that doesn't have to be consciously facilitated or engineered, you simply arrive into this harmonious relationship with one another at some kind of subconscious level, but in a way that it's, it is very, very palpable. You know, you really can feel the effect of it. Um, 
and you know the other qualities that you describe about it that it's a very it's a very unexpected space you know people who come here for the first time will often say oh my this is that it's a, almost a bit surreal you know you come up from liverpool street and there's all of these skyscrapers and you come through this little courtyard garden and into a bedroom tent is kind of the last thing that you would expect and partly because as you say because it's it's this fabric structure it feels intimate and it does it feels a little bit vulnerable like as you say it's kind of porous and um and i do notice even when we sometimes host workshops or events where we might start a group of people out in the nave for a presentation or a more formal conversation and then you bring people into the tent the quality of the atmosphere changes in such a palpable way um and it, and I think that does have to do with those qualities that are just designed into the space itself. And I, and I do think we think a lot at St. Ethelberg is about, about space, about working with space and the qualities and properties of space and how in a way both a subtle but also hugely efficient way of working that that can be that there's so much that you can do. And of course, we're given that because, because we are custodians of a space that has such a strong identity and personality. But there's so much, if you're able to design it into the space and the container, that you can almost sort of back away as a facilitator to a certain extent, because it's already been seeded in the atmosphere. I don't know if that makes sense. No, it does. I mean, it very much stresses why design is so crucial yeah. and the work up front that can invoke the right spirit um, and so help surface certain qualities and attitudes, you know, around this word love um, feels absolutely spot on. And, um, and partly because it's so distinctive in the environment in the middle of the city of London there. Um, it, it's also taken my mind to what you were saying about reverence. And that, that feels um, quite distinctive and different and maybe even um, slightly alarming um, to people because it comes out of this religious context. But in a way, the idea is that just reminds us of something in our humanity rather than because of any particular faith commitment. Um, and I wonder whether it can be put like this. This is me thinking on my feet now, so I don't know whether this will make sense or not, but it made me think about the difference between approaching conflict, difficulty, um, through a lens that may be very shaped by moral concern, um, as opposed to shaped by something more transcendent, a sense that there are there are principles that are active, you might say at a more soulful level, and that, that, that will us into a better tomorrow, that are generative of what's good, and striving for, say, truth or feeling the path of beauty, um, principles, again, associated with love, um, that, that don't therefore lead people immediately into um, more conflict, maybe a moral conflict, you know, a discussion about what's right or wrong, good or bad. Um, I'm not saying that's not necessary, but if you can find another way of approaching that which is good, and maybe this idea of reverence, a sense of the transcendent, the story the history you mentioned there, we all, it, I know when you were saying that, I wanted to sort of breathe in. It's like it provides more space um, and then everyone's got a bit more space to breathe. Um, a three-dimensional approach to these um, issues, you know, not just in terms of space, but in terms of time too. And then this possibility of a vertical dimension, which is certainly held in religious traditions, but I think it's part of our shared humanity as well. Reflecting back to you in that way, does that make some sense? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I've 
been speaking quite a lot from the perspective of the, you know, the history of St. Ethelburgus. And that's obviously, you know, being custodians of this space and custodians of those historic stories is a big part of what we do. And we have a whole portfolio of program offerings that we run. And our, our strap line or our mission is bridging divides and loving earth. And so while we do continue the work of, of uh, peace and reconciliation, which has been at the core of St. Ethelburgus since its inception, our focus at the moment is really on looking at this intersection between climate and peace. Um, and, and for us, it's actually quite, it was quite important to put the word love into our strap line. So bridging divides and loving earth. And, and I think, you know, where I connect with what some of what you're saying, because I think some of what you were reflecting back to me or some of what I got from that was an invitation to consider the need to create an expansive story of the sacred or the transcendent, which might not just be identified with a particular faith tradition, right? Just with Christianity or, or even any of, you know, particular faith tradition, because there are many, many people who don't connect with those, you know, with a traditional faith, um, and yet who experience, uh, you know, a, a, a sense of deep values and a sense of the sacred, a sense of the importance of, of inner life, whether they even language that as spiritual life, and that we need to have a language around reverence that's expansive and respectful enough to, you know, to invite that whole breadth of, of, of expression, of human expression of, of the sacred. And I think that is, you know, that is something that we think a lot about as an interfaith center. Um, and I, I think we often work with the lens of spiritual ecology. So this idea that creation itself is sacred and that our relationship with creation is a relationship of intimacy. Um, and, and I do think, you know, certainly our, a lot of our programs over the past maybe five or six years, we work with a lot of climate activists, with a lot of young climate activists, you know, some of whom may, may belong to faith traditions, many of whom feel a deep um, instinctive, like, uh, knowing, right, of this interconnectedness and this sacredness of life, of all of life, of the natural world. And I think for us, that's a very helpful common ground that we find it really helpful. And it you can often bring a group of people into that shared atmosphere of the sacred, of what we honor together beyond ourselves or beyond even our shared interests as a human family, you know, simply by, you know, by inviting connection with nature. It's very visceral. I also wanted to just ask you quite a, a specific question. You have this word love in your strap line that you mentioned there. Um, what does that word mean to you in that context? Because this word love, it's one of these words that um, I think it's worth constantly asking ourselves again quite what we mean by it. So what, what, what does it evoke for you in that context? In the context of our strap line, Bridging Divides and Loving Earth, you know, organizations agonize over strap lines. Uh, but when that strap line came into the mix, I think there was just a shared collective sense of, ah, yeah, that's it. Um, and maybe a few hesitations at the time about whether we could really put love in our strap line or what, how that could be received. What does it mean to me? I, I think that it means that the work of responding to the scale of what we're facing in terms of 
climate and ecological unraveling is so immense. You know, we're speaking at a time COP28 is, is happening now uh, in Dubai. We're set to be, this is the hottest year on record. I, we are set to fluctuate this year above the 1.5, above pre-industrial temperatures mark. You know, that every successive COP has been promising to keep us below that threshold. And I think the collective sense of fear and dread about walking collectively into a future, which isn't just a different climate paradigm, which is an inherently unstable climate is what we're walking into. You know, these are immensities that defy human imagination. And and I think confound our collective sense making so that when we facilitate groups, we've designed a lot of programs responding to climate, you know, they collect, they confound our ability to sense make at the small local scale, at the national and international level, we are collectively confounded. You know, I think what comes into my mind now is a, is a, is a teaching um, given by a Sufi teacher, his name is Llewellyn Von Lee, really simple teaching that the earth is not a problem to be solved. She is a divine being to be loved and revered. You know, that's my personal belief. And, you know, as I said earlier, the spiritual ecology framework and worldview is, you know, is a really important lens for us at St. Ethelburgus. And I, I also feel that um, returning to that relationship of love and intimacy is a helpful and, and practical, practical kind of form of psychic protection, actually, in a time which is so inwardly dysregulating for us as individual human beings, to return to the wholesome ground of love, I think is a survival skill in our time. So that for me, I think that's what it means that it's in the strap line. Hello, thank you very much for that. And I, I agree. I mean, I think that um, maybe with the crises which we face uh, and the difficulty of making sense of them, hence them confounding our sense making because they're so multifaceted or they conflict so directly with our way of life. Um, I mean, I suspect that what's brought to consciousness in the current context is actually always the case that we're not in charge of our lives, that we don't have the control that we feel we would like. It's just that we can't ignore it anymore. And so then the powers and principalities, you might say, the, the spirit that you evoke in facing that reality becomes really crucial because if you invoke a spirit of fear, of disaster, um, of apocalyptic nightmare, um, alone, then that is the world in which you'll live. Um, and so to know how to invoke um, the good spirits um, and a sense of love, keeping that which can guide you like a North Star in front of you, as you say, does become a skill for survival. Um, I mean, I suspect that it's always been an important skill, that which offers wisdom and, and sucker now. Um, but yeah, I think that th there is a risk um, with anticipating such a dark future um, that we slightly become self-fulfilling prophecies um, and um, because we forget part of our humanity um, in the process. You know, this is, you might say, um, a crisis of soul as much as a crisis in other dimensions as well, um, but also a kind of return 
um, to things which the modern world has forgotten, and which you know you're 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 raising to 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 what to consciousness so beautifully now. Um, does does my way of reflecting it back to you make sense again? Before just one further area that I wanted to touch on, um, but just to check with you that that makes sense as well. Yeah, I think that does that does make sense. And I think what we hold as our guiding star and where we move from as our essential intention is, is really so important to be conscious of and to be, to have a kind of diligent integrity and sense of kind of almost like spiritual hygiene about, um, because I think you know, whatever you, your personal sense or whatever your analysis of the scale of crises that we face, it is that kind of inner clarity of purpose that will orient you in that landscape and that will help to give you the power to shine a light and be a force for light. So look, that that nicely brings back just to the the final question, which I wanted to ask now, um, which again is quite a practical question. Actually, um, we you've mentioned intention, um, reverence, um, the stance that you bring to a discussion, to a meeting, to a gathering. You've got the place there. Um, what are the other things that you found foster? that different kind of attitude that can help bring love? You know, what are the design principles um, practically when people meet in the public square, not otherwise necessarily knowing each other, maybe on different sides of debates and conflicts? Um, you know, are there the top three things even, if I can be so crude, um, that designers might think about um, when it comes to bringing people together? Right. Um, okay. Yeah. So we, I can describe some of our uh, program work. We, um, so we run a program, a really beautiful program, which is called Lifelines. And, uh, this program brings together different community groups. They might be different faith communities. They might have some, uh, differences or tensions between them. So two groups who go out together to um, plant wildlife corridors, so um, hedgerow corridors, trees and hedgerows across tracts of English uh, farmland. And so that's bringing together often urban communities with rural communities and having a kind of immersive retreat experience that is also a spiritual ecology experience. Uh, where people are coming together to do something really practical, you know, really action oriented to, you know, to help, um, you know, biodiversity here in this country, in the UK, to do that with a sense of, of reverence and shared prayer, with a sense that this isn't just a kind of, you know, <laughs> putting the trees in the ground and, you know, digging with spades, but that this is something done with reverence and consciousness that, that we are interconnected with the living world um, and that nature is sacred. And, you know, as I mentioned before, I think inviting people to connect, you know, not just intellectually, but in a practical, sensory, visceral, immersive way to come into that more intimate, deeper relationship with our shared common home, which is creation. You could say that that's a design principle that we work with quite a lot at St. Ethelberga's, um, which does, you know, when you facilitate, you're often working with what can seem to be quite ephemeral qualities, qualities of atmosphere, of feeling, of sensation. But when you work like that, you can, you can feel, <laughs> you can feel the difference. Um, and there's something kind of magical and exponential 
about the way that people are able to open more intimately within themselves to reach a more intimate level of trust and connection in a group, the quality of joy um, <laughs> is really, you know, it's, it's exponential, it's magical, it's, it's taking place kind of in a different dimension and on a different level. And you can't quite, I couldn't put on a spreadsheet why that works, right? But it's when you're able to work with those kinds of qualities as a facilitator that you know that you've tapped into something truly um, valuable. So I would say that would be one. Maybe that would be my first, you know, hot tip for, for trying to sort of use the calling to love as a design principle and how we work with facilitated spaces. I do think... The second one that comes to me is about truth telling. Um, you know, I think I said earlier, conversations and group processes, shared sense making, and the actions that can arise out of those processes, because very often what we're working with is a group of leaders who are, you know, like you are working with a group of designers who you hope to nourish and resilience so that then their projects can cascade out impact into their different sectors and we often work on a similar model but that you know bringing ourselves to that moment that you know in that story of richard charter where you know the bomb goes off and he's in the crater bearing witness with his feet his body, his presence, his heart, and his intelligence, you know, hard up against the truth of what we're facing. And I do take on board, you know, what you were saying earlier about the danger of projecting catastrophe becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think personally, my, I personally, we're living in a moment when the danger of not understanding the risk, failing to have the honesty and the stomach and the resilience to face the scale of risk is a greater danger. I, I understand the danger that you're pointing out. And so, a, and so we have spent a lot of time as facilitators designing processes because it's all very well to say that, let's face the truth. But, but to really do it in a group of people, to navigate all of the, you know, the treacherous waters that are going to come up, the, the denial, the resistance, the fear, uh, the conflict, the being triggered, um, the overwhelm, the wish to bypass, the uh, overwhelming grief, how, do we walk into the truth together honestly, deeply, and with some sense of containment and safety? And so we have, we've spent a lot of time designing processes that allow us, you know, to do that. And, you know, I, giving homage and, you know, referencing all of the others who have influenced that work, like, um, you know, Joanna Macy's work. Um, uh, the, which I can't remember the title of the, the way to reconnect or I can't remember the, forgive me for not remembering the title of it or the deep adaptation work of Jim Bendel. Those have been two major influences on our work. And you asked for three, my third top tip for bringing love into facilitated spaces. Um, I mean, I mentioned it before, you know, but it's prayer and, um, maybe that's just quite personal, but to pray for the work, to pray for every group that meets. And again, I, I think there's something for me in that, that I hope is relatable beyond, um, this sort of silo of those who maybe have a prayer or meditation or contemplative practice, because I think 
when you do pray into a piece of work or when you do hold a group in prayer, it's like when you take people out into nature, it, you feel the difference. It, and there's something about acknowledging the reality of the inner. You know, we live in a culture that's got a very difficult relationship with the inner. Um, and we like to treat it as a source of sensation or a, a territory where emotions live that we need to have help to know how to manage them. Or sometimes we think about it as a place that, oh, there's a resource there. There are powers on the inner that we can utilize you know, for good or for ill, you know, the inner is real. <laughs> it is a place where tremendous powers live. And, you know, our culture has somewhat castrated itself by forgetting that. And so when I say for me that prayer is an important ingredient, it doesn't have to be public. And I think the other thing about it is that it's so efficient. It can be very private. You can be sitting in a public space, in a civic dialogue, in a conversation, and holding that within yourself. You certainly don't have to put, put a big sign on or make a statement about it. But I do think there's something, there's something important about it. I think there's something really quite practical about it. And even if prayer doesn't mean anything to you, to turn towards the inner with some quality of respectfulness that there's a sovereignty there that is beyond beyond you, I think is wholesome and, and healthy. And so I don't know, those would be my three top, off the top of my head, those would be my three top, top three. No, thank you for that. And thank you for venturing um, into latterly that area of prayer but you've been doing it throughout the conversation um because i think that what i take from that if nothing else is that these this is about reaching into dynamics that um that aren't just transactional that aren't just driven by utility um that aren't part of what we can quite readily access actually in our culture because it's very good at those kind of things um, but to look beyond to that which is more. Um, and so, as you're saying there, you know, whatever people might make of prayer, um, as well as the other things you're mentioning there, the kind of the embodied side, um, and then also thinking about um, how people come together. There's, if there's been one word, maybe, um, in uh, amongst all the other words that could be, um, I, I'm, I'm hearing this, um, that love... Um, needs to be close to openness um, to, you mentioned vulnerability um, at the beginning, maybe a kind of humility um, that love enables us to turn to and so um, receive, become aware um, of, of more than um, we maybe even ever hoped might be there or might be available. Um, I think love can do that. Love, I think, is part of our intelligence because um, whilst it um, it brings up suffering, it brings up fear, it brings up yearning, it, grief you mentioned, the, the sense of loss. Um, it also prepares us, um, in even in that breakdown, for receiving that which currently lies over the horizon. I think wisdom, spiritual traditions teach something a bit like that. It's why crisis can be, in fact, a turning point. Um, but anyway, that's that's... <laughs> a lot from me perhaps in response but uh unless there was anything else claire you, you did want to add um, maybe that's the point to pause how does that seem to you thank you mark and yes i loved your your last reflection and it just brought the word paradox <laughs> into my mind and how love can often not exactly resolve paradox but give us the ingredient that we need to be able to endure and thrive within it. Um, yeah. Anyway, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Um, thank you for inviting me to have it and just be very curious to sort of watch how, how your project develops. 
and where it goes from here. And I hope, well, look, you know. Yeah, well, thank you. And, and we'll, we will stay in touch for sure. But cheers for now. All right. Thank you so much, Mark.